Good afternoon. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So uh, I was just going to take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about what we do at Leo Labs. I'm the chief operating officer and uh, one of the co-founders of the company. The reason we're in business is there's a second space race underway. The first space race was all about exploration and the Apollo missions and going to the moon and deeper off into the solar system. The current space race is all about plugging space down into the economy here on the surface of the Earth. So it's delivering that broadband internet access all around the world. It's IoT connectivity, it's safety services for airlines and planes and uh, ships on the sea. And it's also precision uh, navigation for construction, agriculture, self-driving cars, uh, and the like. So space, the real exciting thing for us is that space is now becoming part of the global economy in a very big way. So what we do is essentially air traffic control, but for space. We build and operate large radars on the ground and generate huge data sets about what's going on in orbit. And in particular, we focus on low Earth orbit, the portion of space that's closest to the Earth. This is where the second space race is happening. This is where the astronauts are going. This is where all these new low-cost satellites are going. And if you take a look at the display here, this is our picture of the last 24 hours in low Earth orbit. You can see it's really disorganized. Satellites are going north, south, east, west, every direction in between. And on top of that, they move quickly. They're going eight kilometers per second. So every hour and a half, they go all the way around the Earth. And so in low Earth orbit, there's no concept of borders, national airspace, national waters, and the like. It's just very unorganized. So we're in the business of bringing some order, bringing some uh, understanding to this situation. Uh, so on this display, every single green, yellow, red dot is a man-made object. There's about 21,000 that we're tracking today. Uh, of those, 9,000 are useful satellites delivering services here on the surface of the Earth. And unfortunately, about 12,000 are pieces of garbage. Uh, so for us as a company, these red areas are the portions of the sky that our radars are monitoring. So we have a couple radars uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, a site in Portugal, the Azores Islands, two in the US, a site in Costa Rica, and then a big part of what we do is also monitoring the Southern Hemisphere with sites in Australia and New Zealand. Because it turns out the world basically has no tracking assets in the Southern Hemisphere. Because during the Cold War, when Generation 1 was built out, all the action was in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're part of, as part of Space Race 2.0, there's a race to roll out a new generation of infrastructure to support the space industry for decades. And so we're putting that in place globally. To provide a little clarity about this chaos, uh, I've broken out a few different groups of satellites. What you see here are all the satellites registered to France in the UN public registry. So there's about 142 objects right now, um, scientific satellites, commercial satellites, military satellites, uh, and the like. Uh, there's a set of satellites that uh, may soon be joining that registration. This is the OneWeb constellation. The, they provide broadband internet access. Uh, they were recently acquired by UTELSAT. And they fly all these satellites so that no matter where in the world you are, you can get broadband internet access. So now middle of the ocean, middle of the desert, on a ship, in an airplane. Uh, their competitors are in, uh, oh, and I should say they have about 600 satellites in orbit. Their competitors at SpaceX, Starlink, are flying this set of satellites. Uh, they've got about 6,000 satellites in orbit right now. That's two-thirds of everything operating in low Earth orbit, and it's growing rapidly. In addition, there's a number of other companies that are just starting to scale up similar-sized uh, constellations. And so we'll see more rapid growth in this area soon. So that's all the useful stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of garbage. So one set of pieces of garbage are the rockets that have carried satellites into space and unfortunately been left there. Um, newer rocket designs tend to bring the upper stage out of orbit, but unfortunately for the past few decades, there's been about a thousand separate uh, upper stages left in low Earth orbit. And this is a problem because each of these is about the size of a car and can get smashed and then leave even more debris in space. So these will be up here for decades. Uh, and then uh, as well, 
What you see here are fragments of old satellites. These are the satellites and the rockets that have blown up, they've been smashed, and there's over 8,000 pieces of these that have also been in orbit for years and will likely stay there for a long time. Speaking a little bit more about the growth, one thing that the, the world is just waking up to is Moore's Law is coming to space. So you may be familiar with Moore's Law in the computer industry. The power of computers doubles about every 18 months. And that is exponential growth that has driven transformation around the globe for decades. That scaling is now coming to the space industry. Since about 2012, the number of satellites being launched into space has doubled about every two years. In the beginning, the growth was relatively small. Now it's really starting to take off. And so my co-founder, Ed Liu, who was an astronaut, flew three times to space and helped build the International Space Station. He recently wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal about how this is going to sweep through not only the space industry, but the economy at large. Space is going huge rapidly. So a little bit more about trying to discern what's going on in space. Uh, you know, you look at that global view of what's happening, and it looks like chaos. There are about five different corridors to low Earth orbit. At the close end, the lower altitude stuff, this is where the humans all operate. This is where the International Space Station is. It's where China operates a space station. Uh, there's also some scientific, there's some commercial satellites as well. It tends to be the cleaner part of space, though. The atmosphere pulls some of the junk out and burns it up. Right above that is where a SpaceX Starlink operates. A bunch of other companies are operating there as well. In this portion of space, it is all about traffic management, basically making your satellites swerve like they're on the road so they don't run into somebody else's satellite. The two corridors above that, the Iridium Corridor and the Bad Neighborhood, are unfortunately portions of space that are not heavily used anymore. This is where there was the biggest collision to date. It's also where a whole lot of rockets and satellites were left from the Cold War. And because there is so much garbage, people don't tend to put their satellites there. Then finally, up at the top is where OneWeb operates. It was actually a very smart move. It is the cleanest part of low Earth orbit. Uh, but it's becoming busier. OneWeb's there, and a bunch of other satellite companies are starting to put their satellites there as well. And it comes with the added complication that if you're going to put your satellites at high altitude, you've got to navigate them up on the way up through all the other corridors, and you have to bring them back down at the end of life. So there's some inter-corridor traffic uh, as well. So for us, we got our start in 2016. Uh, we're based out of Silicon Valley uh, near San Francisco. Uh, it's kind of strange that a company that's only eight years old has six radar sites around the world, has this big infrastructure presence. But the secret is, we actually got our start effectively 20 years earlier. Uh, my co-founders worked with the National Science Foundation to design radars to study the northern lights, like you see in this photo. It turns out, if you're studying the northern lights, you're inadvertently tracking satellites. The satellites are flying through the ionosphere that you're studying. So they had spent a couple decades figuring out how to manufacture the radars, install them above the Arctic Circle, get them to work through the winter months uh, and the like. And the meanwhile, they're tracking satellites and throwing all that data away. And so we had this eureka moment where we said, ah, we can turn this around. We can keep all that satellite tracking data and use it to protect and grow this new space industry. And so uh, we were all at a lab, Stanford Research Institute, uh, which had previously been part of Stanford University. And we spun the company out of that lab in 2016 to create Leo Labs. And so now we not only generate the data with our radars, but we also do the data analytics, we do artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify the really risky and critical situations that are unfolding in space and alert our customers to those. So this is a picture of our radar network today. Uh, the radar on the left is the one in the Azores in Portugal. Uh, these are large facilities, and um, we pick radar as the technology to track satellites instead of telescopes because it works around the clock. It can work through daylight, it can work through all weather conditions, rain, snow, uh, and the like. And also because it can track a lot of satellites. So while we're sitting here, there are a thousand satellites per hour passing overhead. And the same is true for every single radar site. So they spend all day, every day, rapidly tracking all of those satellites passing overhead. Our special sauce as a startup is we know how to build these quickly. We build a radar site in less than a year. 
that's less than a year from breaking ground to turning, uh, to turning it on and delivering data. The competitors, uh, U.S. government, uh, builds big radars in about a decade. Big government projects take a decade to go from breaking ground to delivering data, and that time frame just no longer works with the new space industry. And so we're continuing this construction. We've got another radar site uh, under works today, and the ultimate vision is to go to more than 20 radar sites around the world as the industry scales. So turning to the data and the analytics, uh, we're basically in business, you know, not to run radars, but to actually deliver subscription services to highlight the important uh, situations that our customers see. Today, we have 70% of all the satellites in low Earth orbit under contract. So SpaceX, OneWeb, a number of big government space agencies uh, all use our analytics. And a big part of what we do is safety. We look five days into the future to say, is your satellite going to come dangerously close to another satellite or a piece of debris and send out alerts? So what you see here is one of our videos that shows the uh, close approach of two pieces of debris that whizzed past each other uh, in the recent past. These two objects came within 13 meters of each other, so about the size of this room, and their closing speed was 12 kilometers per second, so many times faster than a speeding bullet. So if they were to clip one another, they'd create clouds of debris, and then there'd be even more debris in space for us to worry about. Unfortunately, this situation is not rare. Over the years 2022 to 2023, our data shows high-risk situations happened about a million times. So there are satellites and pieces of debris coming close to each other all the time. Uh, another big piece uh, of the business, what we do, is also monitor space uh, to help support national security. And we support a number of European governments, we support the US government, uh, the government of Japan and Australia as well. And what we view our role is, is bringing transparency to space. If we can highlight the risky, the threatening activities early, it's likely to deter any conflict in space, sort of like keeping the shipping lanes open uh, on the high seas. And so with all this activity, we use our data and our analytics to zoom in on interesting things. And frankly, it's getting a lot more dynamic and interesting up there. So um, on this slide, you see one of our displays of a set of proximity operations, basically satellites flying up close to one another. Five years ago, it used to be that this happened really rarely. It took a billion dollar space program to develop satellites that could fly close to each other. Now universities have demonstrated it, commercial companies are doing it, lots of governments are doing it. And so in this picture, you see the four dots that have circles around them. Uh, those are all four uh, satellites launched out of China. They were actually launched in two pairs. And they were practicing, they were technology demonstration satellites. There's a lot of very vaguely identified satellites in space. But they've spent the last number of months practicing going in close to one another and pulling away. And you can tell from the motion that it's things like they're practicing taking pictures of each other. Or maybe even in some cases, they're practicing docking and then pulling apart. This situation got even more interesting because the pairs started working together. So they actually broke one pair apart and had the satellite come over to the third. And then on top of that, they're also in a highly trafficked orbit. So you see two Starlink satellites there as well, two SpaceX satellites. So all of these practice activities are happening while other commercial satellites are floating past. And this highlights that you don't have separate military activities and commercial activities in space. It's all in the mix together. And so we've spent a lot more time reporting on and analyzing these sorts of activities so again, we can kind of take down the temperature and nobody gets too um, overly worried about what's happening. We give people an early warning, an early heads up. Um, so with that, you know, I just I want to say it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, we're very proud. We just hired our uh, first employee in France, uh, a space expert. Uh, we think it'll be one of many uh, that we will have here to uh, support the uh, local space industry and more broadly across Europe. Uh, and also, we view ourselves as having built a platform for safer space operations, and uh, we expect to be partnering with a lot of innovative space companies, and we're quite excited about all the activity uh, happening here as well. So, uh, so with that, I'll uh, get off stage, and thank you very much.